this fantastic, lovely memory of Wally. Uh, so I think, thanks to Jim's metaphor, it's very natural to move from talking about, thinking about powerful friend to powerful ideas. So I think uh, it's time to move to the second panel, and I give floor to Richard. Okay. Um, so one of the ideas that's been bouncing around this conference since it started is this whole question of powerful ideas. Um, I'd like to run this session in a way so that we maximize the discussion around the room and not just having mostly old people uh, talking about their uh, thoughts on the subject. So I'm going to ask each of the panel to really to talk for a flexible amount of time with a maximum of three minutes. <laughs> Dropping into the conversation one idea that they would like to get some discussion about. We can have plenty of time afterwards to have slightly more, slightly longer contributions, but I really want to try and maximize the input from everybody. So let me just quickly introduce the panel in the order that they're written down in the notes. Karen Brennan from Harvard. Wave, Karen. Brian Harvey, who I think you may have heard of already from, from uh, Berkeley. Celia Holes from London. And Mitch from MIT. So I'm going to give each of them, just joking apart, just a very short time, a few minutes maximum, please. Can you all manage it within five minutes? Shorter would be better. And then, while this, this is happening, I'd like you to consider what you're going to talk about to the, your neighbours in this room for a few minutes after the panellists. Okay? And then we'll come together. So, Karen, do you want to start? You can stay there if you like. I'll just pass you the microphone. So I, I thought I'd use my two minutes, I'm going to yes, shoot for two yes. minutes, uh, to tell a little story as a way of motivating my provocation for the panel. So at Harvard, I teach a course about constructionism. And as part of the course, we read a lot of texts by Seymour Hubbard. And a group of students came to me early on in the course in its last run saying, Seymour Papert seemed pretty obsessed with math, which I felt was a bit of an understatement. Uh, but they had a hard time imagining themselves as being connected to the notion of powerful ideas, because actually some of these students were really sort of math phobic and anxious about it. So, well, do the ideas we care about not count as powerful ideas? So the provocation I wanted to bring to the panel was, who gets to decide what constitutes a powerful idea? And to what extent should we be really broadening our notion of a powerful idea and its framing to include stronger notions of learner agency? So that's, I don't think I was talking about but that's that's it. Could you just say what you mean by stronger notions of learner agency? Well, I wonder, like, what if the book had been children, computers, and learner agency instead of powerful ideas? Like, it, I guess a stronger notion of learner agency, who gets to decide what the powerful ideas are? Okay, that's the question. Yeah. Okay, who gets to decide what the powerful ideas are? Lots of sub-questions to that question. Um, Brian. Uh, you can stay there if you like. Uh, I need a computer. I think there are some computers here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> While you're doing that, setting it up, would you mind if I went to the next person? Uh, no, go ahead. Celia, do you need a computer? No, I need a computer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll take the Okay, that's a good suggestion. Maybe you, in your groups afterwards you can think about naming a powerful idea. And by the way, it's very reassuring that students at Harvard are math phobic like everybody else. And that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, while Brian's talking, could you get your computer ready? Mitch, do you mind? Uh, sorry, this is the usual well-oiled machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I'm going to use a couple minutes talking about my own trajectory in thinking about these issues. And when I think about what I gained from Seymour, I tend to think about three big themes in Seymour's work that were a very big influence on me. One of them is learning through making. A second one is building on personal interests. And the third one is engaging with powerful ideas. So for me, engagement with powerful ideas is one of three big themes that I gained from Seymour. In some of my early work, some of you are familiar with work that I did actually for my PhD under Seymour and others, was this environment called Star Logo that allowed people to build simulations of massively parallel systems, birds in a flock, cars in a traffic jam. And it really enabled people to engage with the powerful ideas of emergent phenomena and self-organization and decentralized system. And I feel that those are powerful ideas. They cut across things you can see in all aspects of life. So I was excited about these ideas, and I feel people gained from it. But I also found that project ultimately was not fully satisfying for me, because it didn't fully resonate with the other big themes. It didn't do enough to support people in truly engaging and learning through making, even though they were making the simulations. They didn't really allow them to fully explore the idea of making. And for many people, it didn't connect enough with their personal interests. It certainly did with some, but not all. I really, and again, another part of Seymour's group, connected with everyone across personal interests. So my own work, I do think it has evolved someone with this scratch software, has an environment and community, has really emphasized my exploration of how can I really deeply engage with those other important ideas that Seymour brought, of learning through making and, and building on powerful on personal interests. And I think Scratch paid a lot more attention to that. And I think it's really difficult to engage with all three of these ideas. I think that's one of the big challenges for this community. I do think one of the successes of the early work in Turtle Graphics was because it could engage with all. There's a part of my stories where Seymour says, oh, but Turtle Graphics, I talk a lot about it here, but just one example, there'll be 50 different ones in the coming years. And he was wrong. There were not. It's really hard to have ones that cut across all of those. So for me, the quest goes on to try to connect with all of these. I think that's one of the challenges. For me, one way I deal with that is when I said that the power to try to bring to, because I don't want to lose the powerful ideas as I explore learning through making and building on personal interests. So what I've tried to do is to look for the powerful ideas in learning through making. Because I do think there's a lot of powerful ideas about the process of making. These are the things that actually Karen has outlined in some of the work she's done on computational practices, ideas about experimenting and iterating, testing and debugging, abstracting and modularizing, reusing, remixing. Those two are powerful ideas. So I think I've been trying to say not just about learning through making, but learning about making. There are a lot of powerful ideas. So for me, the big question is how can we make sure to, yes, stay true to powerful ideas, but also engage with those other themes. It's not easy to do all three. That's one way I've tried to stay in contact with all three of those themes. And I think that's something that I see as a challenge as we look ahead. Okay, thanks, Mitch. Um, are we ready behind yep. me here? Okay, we got your powerful ideas right here. Um, so, quickly. This is a list that I made um, of numbers. It could be a list of anything, but the example is easier with numbers. Um, and uh, what I would like to do is uh, multiply each of these numbers by three. Okay. Um, so you can imagine um, for i equals one to length of list, by yada yada yada, the way you were taught to do it back 400 years ago when we all learned to program. Um, but there's a better way, and it's like this. I'm going to say map number times three over this list, and I get 21, 24, 3. OK? Um, what this does is it takes you away from index variables and looping and gets you right into the thing that you want to do. I want to multiply each of these numbers by three. Can't say it more clearly than that. What, what powers that, what makes that workable is the ability to treat 
function is data. So what do I mean by that? Um, let's take 2 times 3. If I click on this block, what do I get? Yeah, I get 6. Um, but now I'm going to put that block in a ring and click on it. And I don't get 6. I get block 2 times 3. Now, this is the idea that everybody thinks is way too hard for um, college freshmen to learn, let alone high school students. Um, but if you've been using Scratch and you're familiar with what a block is, you can't not understand this, I claim. Right? You look at it, I clicked on it, what value do I get? I get the block, 2 plus 3. And um, when I want to use a higher order function, like the map example that I showed you, the ring is already there, so I don't even have to think about rings. I just grab my function and stick it in here. Um, and unlike the 2 times 3 example, this one has a blank slot. And that's the one that's going to get each element of this list substituted in. Um, so that's my favorite powerful idea. And um, I guess when, when Scratch came out and they made the decision to leave some things out, it might have looked as if that was um, a limitation of visual programming. You know, well, we can't do those things visually. We need a grown-up language for that. Um, but it's not true. On the contrary, visual programming is what makes this idea so very understandable. Thank you. So this was the, uh, the Congress I went to, and I was actually there. And I was extremely lucky to be there, because there were lots of powerful ideas when I look back at that Congress. I luckily was there, because I still have the proceedings, and I scanned a few pages. These were the people who spoke. George Pollier, who you would have heard of. Jean Piaget, you would have heard of. James Lightell, I hope you would have heard of, the first president of the Institute of Mathematics in his application, that I'm very honored to be president now. Hans Freudenthal, I'm sure you've heard of, one of the great mathematicians from the Netherlands. And so we go on. In fact, the person I learned most from uh, was that guy, Hugh Philp, who was talking about mathematics in developing country. And there was, I was a, a maths teacher in a, an ordinary high school in London, and I, there were many powerful ideas in his talk. And then there was something else that happened, which is why I'm mentioning this because there was a turtle workshop with Seymour Papert and his colleagues from MIT. I was teaching. I knew nothing about computers. I wasn't really interested in computers. I was mathematics and mathematician. And there was this incredibly peculiar thing going on. I don't remember much about it. So in fact, all that follows is courtesy of Cynthia Solomon, 
All I remember was it was really weird, and I didn't really know what it was about. I remember there was being signs to go to the turtle pond, and I thought, well, I'll go along and see what happened. And there was a, work, a workshop by the MIT Logo Group, run by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. There were, it was basically run in the good spirit of constructionism by the kids. There, they had apparently worked with the MIT group before. They actually did all the work. They were all boys. In fact, all those presentations that I showed were all men. I didn't notice at the time, to be honest. I notice now. Uh, but these, these boys were amazing. They showed us all about what to do. And they even put out a small fire, apparently, while everyone else was at dinner. And they just took it over. And that was a, just an amazing experience that I remembered being very formative as a young maths teacher. I think, oh, wow, that's incredible. I didn't go immediately and learn programming. It happened later. Uh, when I won't go into that. But I want to just show you the invitation flyer. They just have bits of paper stuck on trees to say, go to the MIT Turtle Pond. And there was one that was all about students writing programs. Remember, this was 1972. And uh, you can imagine me, I was just a mathematician, I didn't know anything. And there they were, they had these turtles going around, they were making video games, they were uh, making music. It was quite extraordinary. But the powerful idea, which is one I've lived with, I think, and try to encourage in my work and in my students, and this was a powerful idea, it was the end of that flyer that came from Seymour Papa. It was, that let the student learn mathematics as applied mathematics, in the sense that mathematical knowledge is an instrument of power, making it possible to do things of independent worth that one could not otherwise do. And I think so few students see that about mathematics. And maybe you could actually put other subjects in there. They just see it as a set of procedures and calculations. They don't see it as an instrument of power for them so that they can do something, see things they couldn't do otherwise. So that's my powerful idea. Thank you. to all the speakers. I now just want to give everybody five minutes to consider what you've heard. I want to give the, us five minutes to consider what you've heard. Don't feel that you have to talk to the person beside you if you don't want to. You can just sit and meditate yourself. <laughs> but I'm going to throw it open to the conference in five minutes and I really do hope that we can have different perspectives and especially perspectives of people who haven't spoken yet. Okay, go. Okay, um, I'm going to use the resource we've got. We've got several. We have you and we have the panel. So at some point yet to be determined, I'm going to try and collate your contributions and hand them to the panel, hopefully to have some discussion there and then back to you. We have quite a lot of time. Who wants to start the conversation going? Pranis, and then I can't see, is it Mint? And then you, and then you. Uh, okay, shall I just uh, shout the people here? Oh, okay. So, uh, there's uh, just two points I wanted to make. One of them follows on directly from Karen's point. Um, and uh, it's about the, the, an idea maybe powerful for us, or maybe powerful for the designer, or for the person who embeds an idea in an activity, etc. But I'm, I'm much more excited about the process where an idea, whether it's powerful according to somebody else or not, becomes powerful to the person who starts using it. And the process by which this idea becomes powerful, the process by which this idea gets picked up and gets used in different contexts, where it's identified as an idea, uh, and it's, it's made as, a, as an object with which people think and read the world and, uh, and acquire a, a kind of presence in their social environment. Um, and the, the second comment is um, that I think that we've been discussing too much about situations and tools where powerful ideas are ahead. They are what has prevalence. So we work with this thing in order to try and generate meetings, out, meetings around the powerful idea. But there are so many problems, real problems in the world, that are very complex, they're not resolved, 
they're ambiguous, they're elusive, and powerful ideas may be very useful in these situations in order to engage in discussing or in communities discussing or addressing these problems, but they have a secondary role. They're not prevalent. There may be an issue where there's two or three or four powerful ideas that are useful in some kind of way, but don't present you with the answer or the solution or uh, the mechanism to make something necessarily, but they present you with, with a better richness or a wealth in order to uh, grapple with the idea or in order to discuss the idea. And I think we haven't looked at these kind of, of uh, issues which are very realistic and which students, at least in my experience, feel that they are faced with all the time. Um, problems that make them stressed because there's no solution, give them angst, and that they are not designed so that students can find the answer necessarily. Um, so these two issues, first of all, the process of making an idea, and secondly, when uh, the, the um, importance or the, the status of a powerful idea is not primary, but it's secondary, but nevertheless not unimportant. Yeah, I think I'll react to that. Yeah, go on. As you're near the microphone, you have to. Isn't it actually true that, that a powerful idea is a generalization of those processes that you are uh, describing? It's not something that comes first, but something that's, that's has all those processes and ideas in common. So At the meta level. Yes. Yeah. So that it, in fact, it's a general, generalization, it's an abstraction of those problems and processes. That's all how I see it. That's, that's a okay, powerful can we meta pass, idea. Can you pass my hand to me? Can you wave me, please? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, is it on? Okay, I guess it is now. Yes? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. That's a delay. Um, we were discussing um, the even the notion of the word powerful, um, and then we thought it had to do with like the direction of, of what of where um, like who originates the idea if it's internally or externally imposed. So I felt like the word powerful was more uh, seen from outside than inside. So we kind of shifted around and talk about the most empowering idea. Um, we, we didn't get through all the way to the end, but I propose that it had to be an idea that doesn't differentiate between individuals. So it doesn't matter who originates the idea, but it's something that really resonates with like everyone's humanity in that sense. Um, and then the conversation kind of like revolved around the... Um, <laughs> Like one of the things I thought about, I actually read it this morning, the ice bucket challenge. And how like some ideas just like spread virally. Like what really, what was, is it the nature of the idea or is it the person who originates the idea? Or what really was that, you know, the trigger point? And I thought, um, um, so maybe, you know, the, the concept of the, the ALS ice bucket challenge. It could be that because it's really empowering that anyone can do it. It's um, so I thought that the the two things one is um, you know the notion of the owner of the idea and the nature of the idea. Does that influence you know that idea being the most empowering or not? Okay, so I'm going to shift. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Lara Lama from Weyer University of Technology and I always wanted to know how things work and how they are connected. So when Mitch said his three points are so difficult to connect, that's exactly the thing that I think about. How can I connect all these three things? And it's a kind of holistic approach maybe. And um, sometimes I explore these ideas in my head and sometimes I need to work on them. And um, there are people who need to work on ideas with their hands and think about them. And most of them, I think, need to combine this. And in my opinion, I thought robotics is maybe a powerful idea because it connects people's interests. They can find themselves in it. 
It covers a variety of fields, from engineering to psychology, even law. Because uh, we can think about project management when we build robots. We can think about making laws. I mean, um, people who are interested in lawmaking can also find themselves in uh, robotics. So maybe uh, robots are a powerful idea that could connect not only people's interests, but also the people. Okay, there is somebody around here. Let's do those two. We're going to have to be pragmatic about the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I think you want to be an idea in the microphone. <laughs> uh, my name is Sandy Wani. I come from Cyprus University of Technology. And uh, building on uh, Hair's idea, um, I would say that uh, the powerfulness comes from the culture and the people that have the power to engage together and uh, using the technological trends that um, bring them together to um, make and uh, contribute to the evolvement of a powerful idea. So uh, what we have been discussing here is uh, how our students that have learned to follow um, a linear um, uh, let's say process from step one to step two and step three to get to learn something they uh, when they get into a constructionist uh, environment they start to question uh, whether this process is going to learn some lead somewhere uh, questioning uh, on the one hand the learning then the process then the tool but at the end after uh, what Karen mentioned in, in her plenary that uh, a process that is back and forth uh, and then sometimes it's linear or it's not uh, back and forth, they um, tend to uh, understand the process and the uh, engagement and the um, uh, personal interest that comes with the, the group of learners and then in that process is the powerful idea that is uh, that is born and is evolving all the time with the technology and with the culture and the people. Thank you. Can you just pass it down to people? Down the hill. Um, first of all, I have met phobia until now. And I think that's the only one thing that has you like uh, don't connect with like uh, many Pappert's idea about like powerful idea in mathematics, and it's so difficult for me to try to imagine like how 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 the mathematicians you know I have to like, perceive the powerful idea. But like in my experience, like uh, working with students and exposed to some like of the Thai farmers who like uh, involved with this project. Like uh, the first thing that, you know, as a teacher, when I try to think like, what is powerful idea? How can I make my class, my students, like get into that? I think I'm like, probably the idea that can deliver more content, you know, like to make the content fun and, you know, effective and students like it. But from my experience working with kids and, and the stories of the farmers, taught me that like it's so like different like different people has so different powerful idea people, some people like me you know I, I can't imagine myself has any passion or interest about numbers I freaked out with them the numbers but for myself like more like the art painting and music you know it's like drive me a lot and when I can answer myself about the question, the deep question that I have about music, it's kind of like not just like get me to the broader um, topics to learn but it's also give me like a, a new picture of myself, you know, like, a, like a, if I can answer something that deeply connect with myself about music and art which I used to think that it's impossible for me to answer those questions, but once I can get that answer, kind of like I can see myself in a new way that actually 
I can learn. So there is no nothing impossible. And I think this thing happened to some of my students and the farmer in the story yesterday. You know, she was so in debt. So I think like her powerful idea is like she gets to do something with like some kind of like small and and then that idea gives her the new self perception of who she really is. She's not the one who really, you know, like fed up about life, always like give up. I can't make any change to my own life. But once she kind of like get a small success, it builds up the new kind of self perception in herself that, oh, I can do things. I can make things for myself. I can answer the question that I have. So to me, the powerful idea is like, kind of like two steps. One thing, trying to answer something that deeply connect to you, to the kid's interest. And then the effect after you answer that question is your self-transformation. To be someone else. And now I feel like it's like endless possibility. You know, anything that I can think of that I have the interest, I can do it. And and as a teacher, this is the most like powerful idea for me to keep myself in the community full of mathematicians. <laughs> there are so many things for me to learn here, but but I know that to be able to give that moment to a person, it is so meaningful. You know, not not for them to to be you know the good student student, but for them to believe that actually they can do something for their own life. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to just, I know there are other people who want to speak. But I'm just going to ask the panel if they want to come in on this just for a few minutes before we go back to you. Because it touches on the conversation that at least two of them were having during the plenary bit. Brian, do you want to say a few words on this? Can we, switch, can we switch that one off? Yeah, it's off. Okay. Uh, right, so, first of all, I, I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that there are many powerful ideas that are not mathematical. Um, you know, class analysis of society, uh, virtue in the Aristotelian sense. Brazilians of ideas like that. Um, I think that a really important one is the idea of empowerment. Um, you said uh, that instead of powerful ideas, we should talk about empowering ideas. And I'm now saying something slightly different from that, which is that empowerment is itself a powerful idea. And one of the things we've learned from the maker community is that you can teach empowerment with cardboard boxes. Right? It doesn't have to be computers. Um, and it's maybe the most important thing that we can offer kids is that idea of empowerment. Having said that, if you're interested in what to do with computers with kids, um, much of the time, the, the contribution of the computer to the project is going to be mathematical. You know, the project might be about anything. Um, and you might not, as a teacher, want to say to a kid, oh, well, really, you're learning mathematics. Um, but in fact, it is what they're doing, because computer programming is mathematics. It's a, a kind of mathematics it takes place over time rather than the sort of timeless mathematics of theorems and so on. But it's kind of tautological to say that if there's a computer involved, there's some mathematics going on. And we educators shouldn't be worried about that. <laughs> I'd like to say a couple of things about that. I mean, people have talked, obviously there are the powerful ideas and mathematical ones, obviously, but everybody has also mentioned 
It's about your personal identity. And I chose mathematics because that's what I do. And it made a big difference to me if you're an artist, like, you know, there, you will choose other. And I do not apologize for that. But I do think something that drives me is most people out there have no idea what mathematics is. They think it's just sums. And that if you go a bit more mathematics, you do bigger sums. And I think one of the passions of my life is to say mathematics isn't that. It is about a way of seeing the world as artists and musicians. It's a view of the world that is very powerful. It's not that everybody has to do it the same way. It's just that our way, uh, you know, it's just one way. Well, no, not even that. But I do think what people have been saying, uh, what, where we got the original ideas of powerful ideas, is something in the idea, but there's also something in the networks. I don't think it's how we spread the ideas. It's you spread it through people. I mean, the wonderfully moving tribute to Wally was something because he spread it. He spread his ideas through Wally. And his ideas will continue, because he did so. And I want to actually say, I want to ask Jenny, who is just sitting there with her camera. Uh, in our little group, we did talk about small, well, with Ivan as well, small powerful ideas and big powerful ideas. And she gave a wonderful, a wonderful small mathematical idea. Could you, rather than me reporting what you said. It's the, it's the joy of a young kid, and I think somebody was talking about, you were talking about being a teacher. The wonderful thing about being a teacher is when you see some kid just learn something that they hadn't got before. And I remember one of the early videos I saw was Sylvia Weir uh, teaching kids who couldn't communicate because of their disabilities. And then they were using, uh, I suppose it was a turtle, I don't remember, but the joy of doing something and something happened. And that, I can see that little kid's face was so excited because that turtle moved. And then he got feedback. And normally that kid could not communicate. And the story Jenny said, uh, what somebody in this conference had told earlier, was a mathematical story where a, a kid had discovered, looking at something that didn't move, that that had zero velocity. And it made a connection. Now that's so boring, looking at something that's not moving. But underlying that is something really powerful. And I think that's what it is. Maybe it's a little powerful idea, but I still think it's something that is, is massively important. Sorry. I mean, it's certainly true that there's incredibly important things to do with engaging people in mathematical thinking. And it's a very worthy and important endeavor to engage a larger collection of people and engage with mathematical ideas. I think the point though that some people are making is, and this community could choose that that's the main focus of this community, and that's a worthy endeavor. But I do think that sometimes my view is that the community focuses so much on that that it doesn't focus enough on other things. So it's not saying it's not a worthy endeavor, but and it's a choice for a community of how much to focus, and it could be, it's a worthy thing to focus on. There are other things to focus on, and it's a decision about what one wants to focus on. Another point about the role of computation, it's certainly true that the computation provides all sorts of new opportunities for engaging with mathematical ideas. I disagree with Brian that at the core, the, com the, the computer necessarily is fundamentally about mathematical thinking. It has atoms moving around inside the wires. That doesn't mean it's ultimately about physics. You know, it's about levels. You, of course, it's great for exploring mathematics, but that's a choice to make. And, it's a, it's a, and it can be a good choice to make, but it's not the only choice to make. So I just think, you know, from my story, I would say, although those ideas are very important to me, uh, and in my own development, I found in order to reach some other groups, some of the things that I was doing is trying to look at other powerful ideas about design, and I think that that's another strategy that one can think about and that we should, and I would encourage there to be more space for thinking about some of those powerful ideas elsewhere. Karen, you want to join in? Okay, can we set that up? Okay. 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 okay, let's get go back to you guys. You. Uh, can, can we pass this little microphone around? Now you first, and then who? Well, actually, why don't you just turn, you know, turn one off all the time? So we have the big mic right? Okay, turn that one off. Okay, okay. Let's and, and then you can just shout if you want to do it, and then just have one.
And then we're going up to the, court, the top level. Yes, yeah, all right, Gary, I can see you. <laughs> okay, uh, Tulia, I'm a teacher from Italy. Uh, I read some uh, some times ago uh, from an Italian, uh, uh, he was not a, mathem a mathematician, uh, Silvio Ceccato, he was uh, uh, the, uh, that one who brought uh, the cybernetic uh, views uh, in Italy. And uh, there is uh, just uh, one thing that for me is uh, really uh, very powerful. He said that uh, uh, if you give uh, uh, one coin, uh, if we exchange a coin uh, each other, we just have uh, one coin each other. If we share a, a, an idea, uh, we, have, uh, we both have uh, two ideas. Uh, so for me, uh, uh, mm, those powerful ideas, uh, as a teacher at least, uh, uh, in my experience, are those uh, uh, for which uh, I, uh, I can share with my students, but also with the other, and uh, I can still dream of. Uh, like uh, when uh, you have a nice book uh, and uh, you are really looking forward to, to go uh, at home and read the next uh, pages. So powerful ideas are those in which uh, uh, you can share and uh, build something uh, more. And what uh, from the same person, Silvio Ceccato, uh, was very uh, meaningful for me uh, is, the, uh, is that sometimes uh, we cannot see what there is outside because there is a window and uh, we just uh, 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 we are not able to take off uh, uh, the window between uh, inside and outside. So those powerful when I'm teaching uh, are those in which I can uh, um, let my uh, students uh, uh, take off that, uh, that window because uh, they go and uh, Someone says uh, thinking out of the boxes, but maybe it's more. Uh, they can uh, have enthusiasm and uh, do something that uh, maybe I didn't think uh, about. Thank you. Can we get, pass the mic over there? Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up because I'm quite short. Um, so I heard a word of caution once, uh, which was, um, if you want an idea to take hold, uh, regardless of how good of an idea it is, you s generally have to spoon feed them to people one at a time. I don't mean students who can take in lots and lots of ideas, but to legislators and government people, whatever, um, to popular culture in general, you have to spoon feed people ideas. Um, and uh, a friend of mine was telling me about Isaiah Berlin a while ago, who had the idea of, um, who categorized thinkers into uh, hed hedgehogs and the foxes, and the hedgehogs only really have one idea throughout their lives that they try to promote, and then foxes have loads of ideas, and the canonical example is Karl Marx is a hedgehog, and Shakespeare is a fox. Um, and I think, yeah. Ooh, that's <laughs> that is, sorry. I, I, think, I think that's what Isaiah Berlin thought. I, I don't necessarily think that anyway. Um, so I, I've made a conscious decision throughout my life to be a hedgehog uh, because, because I, I've got one good idea, I think, and I have good other ideas that I think are okay from time to time. But I've spent a while on this one and um, I have decided uh, I'm probably going to have more success with it than any other because I've thought it out a little bit better and I really don't want to let go of it. Uh, it's the one that I'm presenting today. Um, but, okay. And, and it's, it's also, I've decided to be a hedgehog based on that um, advice that you have to spoon feed people ideas. You have to really hammer on something before people get it. If it's, if it's an idea that's a little bit original, that it's, a, it's an idea that's a little bit unexpected. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts on that one. Except for the Isaiah, Isaiah Berlin one, I, I, I'm not promoting that as yet. Okay, can we the mic make its way up to the top corner? If there's somebody on the way that wants to hijack the mic, they can. Thanks. Just a couple of quick observations. One is I don't think it's unusual for a community to get sort of focused on one set of powerful ideas to the detriment of others. I remember having a conversation about um, the Reggio Emilia approach to education, and Mal Guzzi said that the classroom should be a thousand laboratories. And the only one they really got to was art and design. Um, 
And I think that one of the reasons we were discussing earlier, one of the reasons why mathematics is so important for us to focus on is because the gap between the mathematical powerful ideas and the experience of the lay person is so wide um, that for a lot of us who for the first time in our lives felt like mathematics was within reach because of logo and, and similar interventions um, makes it really resonant with us. And about I don't know, 15 years ago, our, we were hanging out with Seymour. He was giving a speech somewhere. And his wife Suzanne was there as well. And if any of you know Suzanne, she's a historian. And our son at the time was around 13, 14 years old. He was in the eighth grade. And he loved history. And Sylvia, was sitting next to me, went up to Suzanne and said, OK, we know what Seymour believes about powerful ideas, about constructionism. My kid loves history. What should he do with history, in history, that feels like what Seymour's talking about in mathematics. And she rather cryptically, but very quickly, said he should read Dorothy Sayers. And I wrote this down in the early days of you know, Amazon. I thought that was a historian I was unaware of. And then mumbled, history is a mystery, and went off into the night. And it turns out that reading Dorothy Sayers, who is a Victorian um, mystery novelist, mm -hmm. who uses the forensic tools of a historian to solve crimes, was exactly the perfect micro world for a 13 or 14 year old who loved history and wanted to be a historian in a way that we want to be mathematicians when we're working with logo. I wonder if we could have a contribution, uh, not looking at anybody especially, <laughs> yeah. about the relationship between powerful ideas and, for example, art or music or. Well, uh, well, one powerful idea, a big idea, I like big idea, but one powerful idea, is something that uh, Uri Walensky talked about in Paris, and it has a terrible name, so forgive uh, me for mentioning it, and I guess forgive Uri, but he talked about restructuration. <laughs> and the restructuration, his example was moving from the Roman uh, number system into the Arabic system, uh, that the Arabic system could do for the same things that uh, the Roman system could do, but it offered uh, greater power to do other kinds of things. Uh, but, I, but I think one could talk about restructuration in a, a broader sense, that if you build models, it's always important to build a model that's opposite to the one you have just built. And if you build a mathematical model, perhaps you should also build a visual one. And if you build a visual and a mathematical model, then you should do a theatrical one, and then you should write it in your journal. And I think uh, the idea of deciding that we're only one person is foolish, because we're multiple people. A part of us seem to be stronger than others. But I love the idea, even in, in a discipline like, like, like statistics that I teach, where it's really important always to use at least two different techniques so that what you see, you're sure, is not necessarily an artifact of the model. Models always tell more about ourselves than what's modeled. It's hard. So we might as well try a, a, a multiplicity of different things. So yeah, I take the point that mathematical thinking is lost to many people, and they should learn about it. But we're also, our, our ability to draw and to interact tactically with the world is lost to most of us too. Uh, and let's get back to this. And insofar as this organization can help, I think we should help. Okay, how about and then Jen? Okay, because I'm already damaged by science, I will go from a scientific point of view about powerful ideas. In mechanics, power, this is force multiplied by velocity. So this uh, shows me the answer why some ideas, very good ideas, have no impact. Just because they do not produce change of, of places like velocity. So a powerful idea is an idea which is either very strong, has a very big force, or an idea that uh, makes a big change. This is the velocity component. And the only thing that I still cannot find a solution is why bad ideas always become powerful ideas. They don't have force and don't produce the loss, but they are very powerful in a negative sense. Okay. Um, Jenny, do you want to 
I think I know well Bulgarian. My husband says there are very few languages I could be silent in. I have been trying to translate powerful ideas since the first time I heard the phrase. I know what powerful is. I can choose at least three synonyms in Bulgarian. I know, I think, I know what idea is, it, it is idea in Bulgarian. I haven't heard the phrase powerful, powerful idea in my language before. Uh, I know that in Russian, powerful ideas is tra translated as Pereverotsa Znanya. And I now try to see what, it's, uh, what uh, Google Translate says back. It says, a revolution of the consciousness. Maybe it is because our uh, politicians think that just that when they have ideas they are powerful, but this phrase uh, does not exist in my language. So my question to you is, if you translate literally powerful idea in a language that is not English, does it make sense? I have heard the original, new, old idea, never before seen a paper of powerful idea. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to have to, I'd like to give the panel 30 or 40 seconds each, uh, and then we should wrap up for the time being, I think. Sorry, I know there's a couple of people waving at me, but would you let me do that? Karen, you can to start with you haven't said anything yet. So something that struck me as I was listening to the comments was just this theme around process, not sort of relying too heavily on powerful ideas as an endpoint, but even from the first comment from Cronus, and thinking about how are powerful ideas developed. And in preparing for this, I looked at Mindstorms again, I looked at a transcript of a panel that Mitch showed with us, which I will yeah. have to say something about. Uh, but I also looked at uh, the, a paper, I don't know, was it 87, What's the Big Idea? And 2000. 2000. Oh, wow. Okay, so 2000, thank you. Uh, and in it, Seymour offered a criteria for identifying powerful ideas, and in it was a sort of power in use, power in connections to the world around you, and power in synchronicity. Like, does it fit with your personal identity? And so this idea of it has to make sense to you, that personally meaningful aspect of it, but then it's connectedness to the world. I, I heard those themes come up again and again. So not what is the end point, but what is the process by which we engage all of this power is something I sort of lingers with me today. And to pick up on that, I was also thinking this being powerful and empowering. I think we don't, I, I think it's problematic to make the dichotomy because I do think what's in my mind was zero memory powerful ideas, it did have to be a personal connection, but it has to be culturally important as well. So just something you think is interesting or useful to you, but doesn't resonate in the broader culture, is going to be powerful. What he meant by powerful is something that you can apply, but also is something that connects to the culture. So that's one thing. The other thing, I did want to go back to also what Cronus was saying. And I, I liked what you were saying. It was just a little bit when you were saying primary or secondary. I wouldn't use primary or secondary. I think it's a matter of how to engage people. I think there's a good discussion we had, and I really agree with your points on how to start to engage people in powerful ideas. And making that, if we're not building something specifically just to highlight this powerful idea, but we, but we create a context where powerful ideas percolate up in that context. So some contexts are richer in powerful ideas. It doesn't make them secondary, it's just a different approach. And just final word, actually I liked the phrase that Edith Adler used yesterday in one of the sessions. She talked about generative themes. Uh, it, it's not just about making something which is going to highlight powerful ideas, but themes that are generative is probably because it's connected with interests of many people. And I do think, that for me, that was resonated with what Cronus was saying. Choosing themes that are going to generate ideas and engage people in connecting with powerful ideas is, I think, is another important thing, not just the ideas, but the context that people are most likely to find a meaningful engagement with those ideas. Thank you. Just briefly, uh, thank you all for your amazing points. Uh, I just want to mention Pavel's, and I hope I've got your equation right. Did you say force time velocity? Yeah. Yes, I just think that's a, yeah, oh. uh, Yes, power is force times velocity. And I think that's, I shall remember that. Because, yes, it's force, it's got to have something that's 
interesting and some a different way of looking at things that you never thought of before, but velocity, how far it went, how far it spread, I think that's something I need to ponder and that's why sometimes encapsulating things in, in small algebraic equations is quite powerful. But the other thing, the other thing, the other thing that you said is why I'm powerful. It's just something very qualitative about this. We say what's a good one and what's a bad one. And I think we've all been thinking of good, powerful ideas, and there are a hell of a lot of bad ones that also have a lot of force and a lot of velocity. And you may think more about that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the last word. Um, I think that the sort of interesting theoretical question about what makes ideas powerful. Uh, I've been hearing um, mixed up in this discussion with two other things that I want to spotlight kind of in order to bracket out from the conversation. Um, one of them is the sort of internal political discussion um, about the shift from Euro logo to constructionism. Um, because for a large number of those of us who've been in this group forever, um, it was very straightforwardly a group about computing. Um, and then uh, you, Jim, wanted to make it also about dance and art and many other things. And so there's a sort of strategic issue about how successful has that been for our group, you know? Um, which I heard sort of popping up from time to time in this discussion. Um, and I think that is a discussion we should have, but different from this one. Um, the other one is the one about math phobia um, as a reason to think about non-mathematical powerful ideas. And I want to say in this context, again, something I said yesterday, uh, which is it's an absolutely crucial pedagogic insight that you meet people where they are. Um, but on the other hand, you don't leave them where they are. Um, or there's no point to the whole enterprise. And um, I think that the fact that some people, maybe including some of us, are afraid of mathematical ideas is not a reason to de-emphasize them. It's a reason to be strategic in how we raise them. But um, the, the fear of mathematics should be separated from the question of what ideas are powerful and, and which powerful ideas are of interest to us. I'm going to have to ask that. Two last words, the second of which is thank you everybody, let's have a coffee. And the first one is, I, of all the different strategies open to us, the one that I think we should not tre tread is to make some kind of binary choice between being mathematical and non-mathematical. We actually do have here some people representing all kinds of different communities. There's three people here from the London Royal College of Art. Let a th maybe not a thousand flowers bloom, but several and not just one. Coffee. Thank you.